Hello and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. Uh, my name is David Kennedy. I'm a professor of history emeritus at Stanford University and I'm your host for today's discussion. Uh, as the Commonwealth Club continues to host virtual events like this one, uh, it is extremely grateful for the continued support of its members and donors. So we hope you will consider making a donation online or as you've just seen briefly on your screen, you can text donate to the following number, 415-329-4231. Again, that's text donate if you care to at 415-329-4231. So it's my pleasure today to introduce the co-authors, uh, Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett, uh, authors of this new book, entitled The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Uh, Robert Putnam is the Malcolm Professor, Research Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University. He is a leading, I dare say, world-renowned humanist and social scientist. He has written some 14 books over the course of his academic career. Two of my favorites are Bowling Alone, published in 2000, probably his most well-known book, and just if I'm not mistaken, Bob just reissued in a 20th anniversary edition. Yep, that's right, David. And Our Kids, uh, published in 2015. Uh, in 2012, uh, Robert Putnam was uh, awarded by President Obama with the National Humanities Medal, the nation's highest honor for contributions to the humanities. His co-author in this book is Shailen Romney Garrett. She is an award-winning social entrepreneur. She's a founding contributor to Weave, the Social Fabric Project at the Aspen Institute, and she is a co-founder of Think Unlimited, a nonprofit venture working to catalyze the social innovation in the Middle East. So, uh, Bob and Shay Lynn, welcome. And let me start off by asking you a pretty straightforward question. Uh, I'm going to actually get to the question why you wrote this book, but before I get there, I just want to ask how you wrote this book. How did the two of you come to collaborate with each other? How did you get acquainted? How did your paths intersect? And as the research and writing went forward, what was the division of labor or the synergy or whatever we, how we describe how you work together? Well, first of all, uh, David, uh, thanks very much for having us on this, uh, this podcast or this uh, uh, Zoom uh, cast. Um, uh, I should say that it's a great honor for us to be here, uh, not only because of the Commonwealth uh, Club event, which I've been fortunate enough to be on several times uh, for previous books, but also to be, have you be the moderator because, um, and I, David, you can now not pay attention to the next, the next couple sentences here. Um, I think Shailen and I would both agree that there's hardly anyone who was more influential, any academic who was more influential in our writing of this book than you. I think you're certainly the most quoted person in the book. And um, therefore, uh, we're looking forward to this con conversation a little bit the way a pair of, you know, freshmen are waiting maybe to see what their professor says about their first paper. So that's the, we're, we're delighted to be even thought of as, as amateur historians, but we're eager to see what the, what the professor says about our work. Um, so we, our collaboration goes back a very long way, actually. Um, uh, I teach a small seminar at Harvard. I have for 30 or 40 years on, broadly speaking, on civic engagement and, and how, to make, how America can become more, um, more civic and more socially connected and more um, basically a better country. And um, uh, Shailen took that seminar um, about 20 years ago, actually. I think Shailen will correct me about I'm wrong about that. And... Um, so now I'm going to say nice things about Shailen for a little bit. She was the best student, certainly in that seminar, but actually probably one of the best students in the 30 or 40 years I've taught the seminar. This is an undergraduate seminar. Um, and she wrote a, uh, an honors winning a senior thesis that was relevant to this on the progressive era. And then she um, uh, went off, and did her own things. We kept in touch. She took part in a couple of our earlier books. She took part in, she was, uh, was a field researcher actually for our book on religion, which was called American Grace. Um, and um, I began the work on this book, The Upswing, about four or five years ago. And I, 
I was pretty confident in my ability to do the numbers, but I was I, I needed help in thinking through what what the narrative through line was, not just what the numbers said, but what real people would say. And I knew that Shailen was a good writer, and so I invited her to join in this collaboration, which turns out to be which turned out to be both much more long and winding than either of expected. We thought at the beginning maybe that would her her role would be sort of four or five months. It's turned out to be, I don't know, three or four years. Shailene will tell us a little bit about how that collaboration uh, evolved from her point of view. Um, but I th I'm sure we would both say this is maybe the best collaboration I've ever had. You'll be able to see, we kind of, we can almost finish one another's sentences. So we do think, we differ in some important respects, but with respect to how to write and tell a story, we it's really fun. We had a really good time. At least I did, Shailene. How about you? Uh, definitely. And I, I definitely want to echo um, Bob's sentiments of, about what an honor it is to be here, um, especially on the day that our book is published. So this is very, uh, it's an exciting moment for us. And we're really grateful to share it with this fantastic audience um, and and with you, David, our moderator. Um, you know, I'll know, I, Bob and I've worked together, as he said, for many years, and, and I took the seminar the year that Bowling Alone was published. Um, and bowling alone and the idea that American civic um, society was in decline really became an animating feature of um, my intellectual and moral universe and uh, set me on a, a, on a trajectory to have a career in the nonprofit sector and to ultimately um, become the founder of an organization not working in the United States, but working abroad to try and build um, connections and also social innovation. Um, and after that time, after coming home from six years in the Middle East, my husband and I were spending a summer in the Monadnock region of New Hampshire, where Bob has a home, where he spends a lot of his time um, doing his thinking and writing. And we, of course, got together while we were there. And I'll never forget um, the moment when we were sitting at the dinner table with Bob and his lovely wife, Rosemary, and Bob was wide-eyed and, and almost wild-eyed <laughs> with this discovery that he wanted to share about... Um, having worked with a new type of data called Ngram data. So um, Bob can tell you a little bit more about the specifics of this, but Google has tracked the frequency of word usage in all of the books that it has dig digitized, which is you know, millions upon millions of books. Um, and so you can actually search for almost any word to discover the frequency of its usage over time. So Bob had been tinkering with obscure data sets, which is his personal <laughs> pastime, and had discovered this remarkable um, fact that over the course of the 20th century and even beyond, um, at the beginning of the century, the frequency of the usage of the word I was quite high. And then that frequency declined and was replaced by um, a greater frequency of the word we, and then in roughly about the 1960s, that trend reversed and we became less common and I became more common. And this, you know, is an interesting finding for somebody who is, of course, uh, spends a lot of time thinking about I and we in community. But it was even more interesting because Bob was also working at the time with um, this idea of the possibility that there were other ways in which this, what we've come to call the I, we, I curve was overlapping with other phenomena, which is something that I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later. But um, it, it was really fun to see the sort of aha moment when Bob really developed the idea of the I, we, I curve. Uh, we stayed in conversation about that. And then ultimately, I think I came into the project to help Bob shape a narrative that wasn't just about history, but was really about today and about the problems that we're facing as a nation. Um, what we can learn from history to inform what we're doing going forward, and particularly what we can learn about what young people today uh, can do. Because obviously I bring a younger perspective. I'm not a millennial. I'm, um, I'm, I consider myself to be more of a Gen Xer, but bringing that perspective into the book was I think really important and we hope is something that makes it resonant and relevant um, to today's context. All right. The, uh, I don't wanna to get too far down in the methodological weeds here, but I, I can't resist asking. What is the, the scope of the Ngram kind of uh, methodology? Is it newspapers or magazines or what exactly is the base that you, that you scan? Um, it purports to be, and I think largely is, um, the universe is all published books. Books. Period. Books published in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I mean, they actually also have a, another a much larger um, database, which is books published in you know China or Iran or Britain or whatever. So you can you can select whatever you're at the website. You can you can select what corpus of literature you want to look at. And so we look at um, public books published in America, um, which that trend overlaps. That I mean, in general, those trends overlap between America and Britain. But we you know just as there's a somewhat different culture in Britain and the United States, so the trends are not the same in Britain and the United States. Um, and there's been actually a lot of methodological research, David, um, trying to validate this as a measure of cultural change. And, um, and we, didn't, we didn't do those methodological you know, confirmations ourselves. We basically, as we do always, we relied on the, the best researchers in a given area to say, is this data, are these data reliable or not reliable? Um, and um, I'm happy to tell you more about it. I mean, maybe the one thing to tell you is just so they can imagine this, these curves. Um, so imagine a curve of the last 150 years, say, and you want to know how, and you ask the, the, the program, and it's all instantaneous. So you, you can, any of your listeners can just go to ngram.com and, and do this for themselves. They want to know the frequency in which people talk about Lincoln, for example. Well, mostly that's flat. Um, on, because there was a little bit of talk, and Americans were writing a little bit, travel books and so on, about the town of Lincoln in England, um, until, interestingly, in not in 1860, but in 1865, there's a sudden spark, a spike in people writing about Lincoln. Well, you can, you know, anybody can figure that one out. That's he's assassinated, and people begin writing, you know, biographies and histories and so on about him, and then from then on to now, it rises and falls with the you know, the sequence of, of, um, of interest in, um, in Lincoln. Um, or you can do the, the trends in um, very common words, like the trends in the word, probably the, one of the most common words in the English language is the, T-H-E. And you look at like long run trends in the frequency of the word the over two or 300 years. And it turns out that frequency is completely flat. There's been no change in the relative frequency of the word the for at least two or 300 years. No surprise and, there, I suppose. Pardon? No surprise there. No, but that is that illustrates how what you can see. And, and therefore, a lot of other historians now who be, have begun to use these data because it's actually real hard data to help substantiate what you would get from just a general reading of culture. I mean, of, of his, his, the history of culture and intellectual history and so on. And that's, and we, we believe actually the, the narrative intellectual history, the non-quantitative narrative intellectual history and cultural history. But I think everybody now, not just us, thinks it's really nice to have a little bit of a thread of quantitative data to reinforce what you, what your understanding of, of um, the culture, the, the, the non-quantitative narrative is. Just to be clear, the, the data set you use is the, is the, the verbiage that you scan for incidents of this and that and the other word is books, not periodicals. That's right. Okay. All right. I mean, in principle, I think there are other archives that do periodicals, but we didn't do that. And then that, that, as you would guess, the, the frequency of the, you know, the, the, what that, what magazines or periodicals are capturing is real, but it's a little more volatile because it varies because, because magazines are a little less, um, they're a little more up to date and a little more and a little less enduring. I think that's probably true, but we did not enter ourselves examine the magazine data. The three of us could probably talk about methodology for our full hour, but that's not, I'm, I'm sure that's not what most of right. our audience is interested in. So let's move on to kind of the, the, the big question that we might begin with here. And, and Shailen, you've already uh, indicated some part of the answer to this, I think. But just to, to put it as simply as possible, why did you write this book? Why did you devote the two of you several years of your lives and energy to this book? Bob, do you want to take a shot? At oh, I, I thought you were asking Shailen. Well, um, I think, in fact, we probably would similarly give, give somewhat similar answers. Um, David, you know um, that I, um, I'm very proud of my scholarly credentials, and I care a lot about my scholarly reputation. So much, everything I write, actually, virtually everything I write, I write with an eye toward what my peers will think of it. And I, when my peers like it, that makes me feel good. And when my peers offer criticism, I take them seriously and I go back and see 
you know, maybe they were right about the evidence or something or the theories. Um, so I care a lot, but simultaneously, and this is a little more unusual, simultaneously, every time I write a sentence, I'm also thinking, how will that sound to an ordinary American, ordinary reader? And I do that um, because in the end, I want to not just understand the world, I want to help change the world. I want to bend history a little bit. And David, you will recognize what I've just finished saying as the, the epitaph on Karl Marx's tombstone uh, in, uh, in Highgate Cemetery in, in London, which I visited and actually seen the very inscription. He said um, he wanted to not understand the world, he wanted to change it. And it's not that I'm a Marxist, of course, but I, I feel the same way. I really, I want to I have been, I've come into an America which I think badly needs changing, badly needs reforms. And to the extent that I can, I'm trying to write as well for that public audience who themselves can have a big influence on what, on what happens. I suspect Shannon may feel the same way, but what, Shannon, why don't you say what, 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 what your purpose in writing was? Uh, of course I feel the same way. I, um, but I also want to say, you know, a lot of Bob's work has focused on what we might call decline, right? I mean, the, the, his seminal work, Bowling Alone, was really about the decline of civic engagement, the decline of community over the last more than half century now. Um, so the question, of course, became, well, what happened before the decline, right? And I think what's uh, what the real contribution of this book is is to is to zoom the lens of history out a little bit more to ask ourselves, well, if we're in a particularly um, difficult moment as a nation, which of course no one would argue with, I think at this point, and and we've been getting worse and worse over time. What happened before that? And I think um, by zooming out, we're able to see that not only did America experience a decline, we, we've not been in this sort of declensionist fall from grace for as long as we can remember. In fact, we were in a moment very similar, breathtakingly similar to today during the first Gilded Age uh, in, in the decades right before 1900, where America was experiencing a remarkably similar confluence of sort of can, concatenation of crises, remarkably similar to what we face today. And then what the data show is that we climbed up out of that steadily over the course of a 70 year period that sort of brought us closer and closer to the ideal of we in that, that we see in our founding documents, right? The ideal of equality and ideal that we are in this together. And, it, and then after that, we see that something flipped. And so I think, um, especially when I came into this project, you know, Bob was very concerned about writing a book that wasn't just another book about decline, right? Because you know, especially for someone like me, whose entire lifetime has taken place during that decline, it gives a little bit of an impression that we're on some sort of faded course to self-destruction. When in fact, the historical record shows that we have pulled ourselves up and out of a very similar moment to what we're in today. And we hope that the lesson of this book is that we can do it again. Um, we really hope that the readers of this book will have a new lens through which to understand the 20th century and that we can trace the roots of today's problems to a time that was very similar today and learn how a dedicated group of reformers pulled us up and out of that, of that place. So um, here comes a spoiler alert uh, for those of you who have not yet read the book, but the book begins with a truly compelling several pages about all the ills that beset American society. And about page eight or nine or so, it's revealed that the description just you've just read is about the late 19th century. But its, it's, uh, its similarities with the early 21st century are really quite striking. And that, that I take it is the, is the point of the book, is to recollect that we were in a moment of declension or at least a lot of very uh, uh, urgent problems at another point in our history. And we climbed out of that hole and did quite well. And then we <laughs> started to decline again, as you've just said. Um, Historians, of course, you know, worry about uh, and have worried for generations about how to explain the so-called progressive period, that period, that burst of reform, usually associated with the presidencies, uh, the period of the presidencies of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, first two decades of the 20th century. And you make a great deal out of that as a moment when somehow or other the society revitalized itself and set itself on the course to the, the ascent uh, I'll call it broadly speaking in your terms, a communitarian ascent, 
uh, into the 1960s and then things begin to go a different direction. So what, what was your understanding of what made the progressive period tick? What, what, what was it about that moment in time that allowed all those good things to set their course for the future? Well, David, uh, let me let me start off in in, say, in responding to that. Um, uh, David, as you may know, my daughter actually is an historian, and she tells me that in order to get a PhD in history, you have to write ten times on a blackboard. It's a lot more complicated than that. Um, <laughs> that is, historians times on the blackboard. Pardon. It might be a hundred times on the black. <laughs> so we're aware that we're engaging in a slightly suspect uh, exercise here in macro history. Of course, you do that same thing I, I, and, and, and brilliantly. So I'm aware, we're aware that there's a lot going on in the progressive era and we're starting to try to simplify them, some things. Um, but we do draw some lessons actually from the sequence of, of uh, change that was happening um, in that period and throughout the the last 125 years. Let me say just a couple of the things that we draw. This is, I'm both responding to your question about, well, what was going on in Progressive Era, but I'm also um, trying to uh, say a little bit about, well, what might have caused it, which is a slightly different question. What would have caused that period? Um, uh, the first thing to say, I think, is that the Pro Progressive Era was a very heterogeneous era. There were a lot of people who were involved, broadly speaking, in the in the um, progressive movement or the progressive era, progressive people who disagreed, well, certainly had different priorities. Some of them were worried about, um, you know, the, the sweatshops in cities and some of them were worried about the uh, power of railroads to set unconscionable rates for farmers. And, and some of them were worried about, you know, just good government. Can we, can we just have a little less corruption in municipal government? And some, they were worried about many different things and moreover, Many of them were worried, many of them were actually on opposite sides of the fence on some issues. And, and most notably, many of them were personally racist. Now there were some important um, race, race, racial reformers in that period, um, but like W.E.B. Du, w. du Bois and, and others that we can mention. But the, what the main, main point is here, um, the, the progressive, the folks in the progressive era shared a kind of a, a sense that we had to fix America and a shared, a, sense, a shared sense that we were in some sense all in this together, but not, they didn't agree on what we, they should be, we should be aiming for. They simply agreed that we were way too I focused. And actually that turns out to be that characterization of them as heterogeneous, but sharing this emphasis on what we have in common, that also turns out to apply very much to the era we're currently in. I think that's the first thing to say, but then there are many specific lessons. I'll say well, just one more and then Shailen, um, who wrote that marvelous introductory, introductory section that you, you just praised, Shailen will be able to say a lot of other lessons we learned from them. But um, one of the lessons we learned is sort of, this is a little more on the quantitative side. Um, you know, uh, sorry to get a little technical, this, if lots of things are happening at exactly the same time, it's virtually impossible to cause to decide which caused which because they're all, you know, they're all happening at the same time. You can't pick out which is the leading variable and which is the lagging variable. And that's largely true in this case. All of these curves are turning at the same time, and all of them more or less turn at the same time back in the in the in the first turning, the in the in the Gilded Age to Progressive Era uh, turning. Um, the one thing that we can say, it's quite striking. Most people, when they hear about the problem, think this must all be economically determined. It was economic inequality that changed first, driven by something else, maybe the Industrial Revolution or something. And that in economic inequality in turn was the cause of everything else. And the one thing our data show is that story cannot possibly be true. The reason it cannot possibly be true is that the economic inequality, which is one of the main things we're looking at, is a lagging variable. It's changing. It changes after everything else. So we can't be sure which the leading variable was, it's not, that's not very clear, but what for sure is, it sure wasn't economic inequality. And that's, I think is in a way, a contribution to this whole debate about what's causing what. It's, it's, it's very striking to be able to say, since it's the thing that most people actually first believe that it's the economic inequality that's causing everything, it's not, it's reacting to something else. And what that something else might be is a, is a really interesting question. I, I'm gonna stop here for a moment because I think Ashley will have some things to say too about 
the details of the regressive era and what we can learn from those, the lessons. That, this, is, this is actually the main point of our book. We want to tell people the lessons that we've learned from going back to that period because we think they apply today. You know, to me, uh, Shailen, I'll give you the microphone here in just a moment, but to me, uh, I'll just say the two of you, one of the things that's most striking about this book is the way you track the synchronicity of changes in so many different dimensions. And I just jotted down a part, I think this is only a partial list of the different dimensions in which you see very similar patterns of development over the course of the century. Uh, income and wealth distribution. Uh, residential choices, congressional voting patterns, club membership, film titles, song titles, and even baby naming and pronoun usage. I mean, it's it, the, the way that the, those data all track the same patterns of ascent and decline over the course of the century is to me just absolutely striking. And again, I, for purposes of argument at least, let's stick with your position that this begins in the progressive era so we come back to the question now to you, Shailen. What, what was it about the progressive era that set all these things in motion? Yeah, thanks for highlighting some of those trends. I, one of the funnest things about working with Professor Putnam is how creative he can get with the data sets that he's looking at. And I think that that's something that our readers will really enjoy. This is not just a story about macro trends. It's about macro trends that are made up of all these really fascinating micro trends um, that I think will be interesting for people to look at. But to your question, you know, when you look at the intellectual history of the period of the progressive era, um, so intellectual history deals, of course, with the history of ideas. What were people thinking about, writing about? What were um, what were the ideas that were taking hold that might have been new during this time? One of the things that we really see is that the progressives were, as diverse as they were, they were characterized by a, this galvanizing sense of what historian Richard Hofstetter has called moral indignation directed inward. So it's one thing to look at a society that's in a crisis and have moral indignation directed outward, right? Identifying the bad apples, looking at the idle rich and saying they're ruining everything, they're hoarding opportunity, we need to get rid of them or change the structures so that we can get them out of the way. But many of these progressives were themselves elites and were themselves products of these une unequal systems, right? And to a great extent, you see writing amongst these people saying, that they're beginning to recognize their own complicity in systems that are exclusionary and unfair and call themselves to account and then call others to account as well. And so this idea of um, what questioning what during the Gilded Age was a reigning idea, which is um, social Darwinism, right? The idea that the survival of the fittest applies not just to the biological world, but also to the world of society. Um, that was really, a, the, this sort of dog eat dog concept was really a driving idea behind um, the Gilded Age. And the progressives came along and said, you know, I don't think that that's actually the value system that we want to orient our society around. And what we saw replacing the social Darwinists were the social gospelers, many of whom were themselves evangelical Protestants coming and saying, you know, we need to question, as, as Washington Gladden put it, our primary conceptions. What type of men and women are we showing up as in society and how does everything flow from that? So that's one thing that you see as a clear um, aspect of this progressive era. Another thing that you see is that it was an incredibly youth-driven movement. You mentioned, David, that often when people think about the progressive era, they think of Teddy Roosevelt, they think of these national figures who came actually quite late in the period. Um, and we think of also, you know, the progressives as being this sort of group of older people. But when you look at the Jane Addamses and the Walter Lippmans and some of the very famous names in this period, they were doing their most important work when they were under the age of 30. This was an incredibly youth-driven um, change movement in America. And it's something that really started from the bottom up. Ultimately, it was characterized by complementary top-down and bottom-up um, strategies to change America, but most of the ideas that became, you know, national programs and national policy changes bubbled up from these sort of laboratories of democracy, which the progressive Louis Brandeis identified as the real place in localities where people were trying out solutions to problems that were happening on their own doorsteps. And when they found those solutions, those bubbled up to the municipal level and then to the state level and ultimately you know, were fashioned into national programs that gained bipartisan support and changed America 
systemically and in a fundamental way. So those are two, you know, we go into some other um, aspects of this as well, but those are two of the, the features that we really like to highlight about what was going on in this period of American history. So I want to make reference to a, uh, one of the first reviews of your book that came out in the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago by Yuval Levin. Uh, and it's a quite favorable review, and uh, I'm sure you read it the same way. But he takes you to task a little bit toward the end of the review by making the point that if we look to the future and what might galvanize a progressive era-like reform culture today, uh, he, he tries to suggest, uh, it's, it, he kind of waves at it, it's more of a gesture than a real sustained argument, but that uh, mass mobilizations of the sort that you hope to ignite only happen in the wake of crises. Now, my immediate reaction to that statement was uh, the progressive era really didn't see any big crisis uh, right. on the scale of the Great Depression or a truly uh, wall-to-wall uh, total war. American involvement in World War I was really quite marginal, as a matter of fact. So it, 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 World War I figures in the European story much, much more largely than it does in the American story. So by and large, the progressive era is marked actually by a lot of social comedy and consensus from the outset. It, it, there's not a rupture or a shock the way the Great Depression was or World War II was. So it, 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 there's something else going on in the, that progressive moment to put these things in motion. And again, as I'm sure you both of you well understand, a more, a more conventional, uh, now maybe about to become obsolete uh, account is that the great shocks of Great Depression and World War II are the events that really changed the trajectory of American history, created new institutions, uh, led to at least a quarter century's worth of greater income and wealth equality, created the context in which the civil rights movement in the 1960s could really take some significant steps forward, so on and so forth. You're revising that narrative. You're saying it's not World War II, not, not the Great Depression. All these trends are put in motion a generation or two earlier in the early 20th century. So what, what, what's your, let's, let's put the question directly the way Yuval Evan might put it. What, what's the, do we or do we not need a crisis in order to really change direction? Well, um, first of all, in part, David, I think your answer to that, first of all, I, I sh first of all should say, Yuval, Yuval Levine's review is the kind of review that any author dies for. <laughs> because he says nice things about the book, but that isn't the real reason. He took our book, re he's taken my life's work really seriously. And the, 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 the review of the book is actually a review of what I've done over with my life, for better or, or, and, and for worse. And, um, and, and Yuval is a, is a really, really smart person. I was overjoyed when I saw that he was writing the review for the Wall Street Journal. Um, and so I just have to get that off my chest, really. I, it's true that he was critical. And, and he, of course, anything, any book can be criticized. Uh, the question about any books, from the point of view of the author, the question about any criticism is not, was there a flaw in the book? For, there's a flaw in every book. The question is, did they get the right flaw? And, and I think uh, you've all uh, focused, as you have said, on, one, on a couple of issues. I think he's wrong that uh, mass mobilization requires a major war or something like that, or for that matter, a great, a great depression, uh, because the progressive era is the example. I mean, it didn't require, there was no major war going on at the time. And there was, there was, there were crises, of course, but there was nothing like the Great Depression. So I think the progressive era is the best example of how you could get mass mobilization with lots of people in the streets, even without having a single mobilizing crisis in the background. But then there's a second question that you raise, and it actually is raised in your, in your own work, which is, well, was it really the progressive era or wasn't it really those, the, the Great Depression and, and World War II that, that changed the direct trajectory of America? And of course, we recognize that there is that argument, but our argument, as you know, David, is that it's true that the, that the, um, the New Deal and the programs of World War, instituted during World War II were really powerful forces in the right direction, but those, for, the, for, the lar for the most part, especially the New Deal was not created you know, out of the mind of, of the New Deal Brain Trust or out of the mind of, of FDR, they were, most of them had been themselves born intellectually and politically in the progressive era. That's, a, they, that's where they came from personally. And so when they 
set out to try to reform America in the face of this crisis, what do they draw on? Of course, they draw on their own personal experience, which was they were formed in the progressive era. That's the first thing. And secondly, in very specific terms, in area after area, and I know, David, I'm telling you stuff you know, but in area after area, what the progressives did was to draw on uh, programs that had, in the progressive era, been created and tried out at the state and local level. I mean, minimum wage or, or social security or, um, you know, control of monopolies. All of those things which are core parts of the, of the New Deal had first of all been invented and tried out in, in what Louis Brandeis called the laboratories of democracy so that when a crisis hit, that's what these <laughs> now older progressives, that is uh, Franklin Roosevelt and his, um, and, and his brain trust, they reach for where they came from. Now, it's 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 you know it's 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 a it is exercise in in um, you know non uh, fictional history. If you ask, well, what would have happened if had there never been the 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 New Deal? Would that have, would the progressive era have nevertheless had the same effect? I can't say that, but I actually think we can say what the new what would have happened if there had not been the progressive era. And I think the progressive era was actually a critical launching pad for most of the ideas that then later on were repackaged at the national level in terms of, of, um, in terms of the New Deal. And I hope that what one thing that our book will do is encourage historians, I mean, of course, historians have studied everything, encourage them to look back at the origins of the, of the New Deal and to begin to, don't look, don't look, you're not looking back for something that happened that was already a national program in the progressive era. The origins of those things were at state and local government. And that's why I think, and I think I see this happening. You're the expert, but I think I see this happening in the writing of history nowadays, which is people are more looking at what was happening at, at local levels. That's what we emphasize about the progressive era. You know, you make me think I've, I've long taught this general subject in the following terms that in the progressive era, we see the emergence of what I call the basic grammar and syntax and vocabulary of American political culture for the remainder of the century and beyond. But that it, the real accomplishments, the real actualization or operationalization of those uh, ideas that take root in the progressive period awaits the mid 20th century. It awaits uh, New Deal, especially World War II and to a certain degree, great society, civil rights movement and so on. So my, my interpretation looks a little more orthodox than yours maybe, but it's not wholly uh, inconsistent with yours, that the progressive right. point, progressive era is still the point of origin of this. Question is still on the table, however, what exactly is it that galvanizes those people in the progressive period? One of your chapters, you take a title from a famous uh, work, famous to those of us who deal with this kind of thing, at least uh, by Walter Lippmann, Drift and Mastery. Right. And the, the burden of that book is we need more central <laughs> governance and control of this uh, runaway economy and, and in danger of fragmenting society and so on. And it, it, some people, including myself, have read Drift and Mastery as an essay supporting somewhat less participatory democracy and more top-down control. I don't think that is your message. So what, no. you, you read Drift and Mastery differently. So what, what, why do you adopt that, that title as a chapter? Well, we can either answer this question, but Shailen, uh, Shailen has been, I would say, worshiping that book for at least 30 <laughs> years. So why don't you step in, Shailen, and say- even beyond my admiration for it, but okay. Yeah, right, worship is a strong word, but I would say that um, I don't think you're wrong, David. I do think that that's definitely, I mean, that, that's in the text for sure. But we have to remember, Drift and Mastery was written in 1914, right? Again, on this sort of tail end of the period that we're really describing, not the tail end, but the, the, the point at which the progressives were saying, you know, if, if all this stuff we've been doing on the local level is really going to take hold, it's going to have to have the weight of the federal government and the resources of the federal government behind it. I mean, and a, a great example is Jane Addams, one of the heroines of the progressive era and, and someone that's been a personal heroine for me. You know, she started settlement houses um, in Chicago and had this very sort of personalist view of how she might be able to help industrialists see the dangers that they were creating for the children working in their factories and, and the problems they were creating for families by not paying enough. And she would actually 
personally approach these industrialists and say, would, you know, wouldn't you like to do a better job here and, and change some things so that these kids won't get hurt? And, and obviously that didn't work. It might've worked in one or two instances, but she had this, you know, shift over the course of her career in which she discovered that, that, you know, when we're talking about certain issues that maybe cross state lines or issues that are about broader economic forces, we need more broad and more national programs. And I, so I think that that's where that piece of Walter Lippmann's work is coming from, right? But I also think that the, that the real spirit of that, um, that piece is, is the, for me, the main message of it is the power of agency, right? The power of citizen agency. The idea of drift and mastery is that America at the time was in this sort of downward drift, that there were all these forces, you know, outside of the control of individuals, the Industrial Revolution being the main one, right, that were changing life, day to day life for people and changing the experience of democracy for people. And the main point of that book is that we don't have to drift. In a democracy, we have agency to reclaim mastery over the future. Now, the particular form of mastery that Lipman was, was advocating was this more top-down approach. And, and that was maybe a product of, again, what had come before and, and the moment that he was writing the book in. But I think the core insight for today is not, oh, we need more top-down programs. The core insight is we need more mastery. We need more citizens who believe in their ability to take the reins and write the course of American history. Now, you know, what that course will exactly look like remains to be seen. But, you know, again, I, and, and drawing on Yuval Levin's work, I think, you know, he's arguing that we need a rethinking and a rebuilding of our institutions from the ground up, not necessarily from the top down. And, and we definitely share that view. Could I just say one more thing, David? Um, just to note that we actually thought about entitling our book, Drift and Mastery, because it captures exactly what we want to say to the young reformers, to the young people, well, to everybody, but especially young people in America today. We want to say to the people right now, they're the people who are 18, 19, 20, 21, maybe they're going to vote for the first time, maybe they haven't voted in previous elections, and who are a little cynical, actually, let's be honest, this, this generation is, is a great hope, but many of them, you know, remember, they have known nothing but this downward plunge, and they're a little cynical, and and so the purpose of this book, when we wrote it, was to say, we're, it's very much intended for that group of people who know nothing about this history. It's not their fault. They know nothing about this history. And we wanted to say to them, okay, you can keep on drifting, just, you know, go on with the flow, you know, every, you know whatever Facebook or whatever, you know, the politicians are doing, you can just along, or you could follow the example of the progressives and reach out to kind of master history. And I recognize that the idea that agency plays a role in history is a little alien to some forms of, of written history. That is, some people think if you're gonna write big history, you've gotta talk about these external forces, whether it's the, pro, you know, the means of production or whatever that is driving everything. Uh, there is, a, of course, an, an older tradition in history itself that is much more about agency, how real people doing ordinary things and not just Napoleon, but just ordinary people doing ordinary things can deflect or bend the, the, mm -hmm. the flow of history. So it's not an accident that that, that was the title of the, of the concluding chapter. And as I say, it captures from our point of view, what we're trying to do in this book. So we've talked a lot about um, how the trends, and I'll, again, I'll just summarily describe them as communitarian trends of uh, different flavors and styles, but all having to do more with we than I. The famous Tocquevillian um, tension between individualism and right. communal or collective endeavor. Uh, there's more movement in so many different dimensions toward more equality, more civil engage, civic engagement. Um, this is a healthier society. Um, Again, I think we've left on the table, to be frank, uh, exactly what it was that put all that in motion in the progressive period. But the, but the descriptive data are, are really quite compelling, that, as I say, in so many different dimensions that we see movement in this direction. David, I want to I wanna just, for, sorry, I just want to address for a second this question of, um, we've left out answered the causal questions, because um, as, as we have traveled around the country over the last two or three years talking about this, every time we talk to a group of social scientists, they say, we want to know what the cause is. What's the cause? 
And every time we talk to a group of historians, most historians say, if you identified a cause, we wouldn't believe it because history is more complicated <laughs> than that. And so we're sort of caught. Now there's, there's a newer idea that narrative, not, not X causes Y, but X followed Y or X preceded Y is actually a perfectly legitimate kind of exercise. And that in any event is what we're doing. I often think about the case that we're talking about here because all these things turn at exactly the same time. It's very hard to tell in any rigorous way which is turning. It's a little bit, David, like if you see a flock of birds, gulls or something at a, you know, at the seashore and they all of a sudden they move in one direction and they suddenly move in another direction. And even if you're looking extremely closely, you can see who's leading that because they're, they're kind of all turning at such as so identically the time that they're, you know, there's no way of picking out who's the leader. They are sort of all moving simultaneously. And that's this kind of change. Actually, these, with the exception, as I say, that the, that the, econ the, the economic inequality bird is, it's lagging. So you can see it's not the cause, but uh, not the leader. Um, I'm not at all, I don't want to be, feel, I don't feel defensive at all about the fact that we fail to identify the cause. Because I think that is a, mistaken or misleading, um, in any event, a, a, a bootless um, a, a, a approach. In, oh, in well, I, I, with all respect, Bob, I want to stick with this notion of causation just a little bit longer. Sure. And let, let's move from the cause, the question about what caused the beginning of the upswing, yeah. we'll call it the progressive period, and let's talk about what caused the reversal or the, the reversal of direction. I, um, at some date, again, there's no reason to be <clears throat> precise about it, but some date in the 1960s, you right in there, things change. And yep. we go from I to we back to I again in so many dimensions political, economic, cultural, pronoun usage, film titles, and so on and so forth. All the fascinating ways you track this. So let's shift our causation question to that period. Right. If, we're going to leave for further argument what put the thing in motion. Sure. What, what caused it to change in the 1960s in our own lifetimes? Well, uh, Shailen could answer that question too, but that's my, that's my period, right? I, I, I came of age uh, at the very end of the 1950s and I was in college in 19, I graduated from college in 1963. So I'm a, not quite a boomer. I'm a little older than the boomers, but that's, that's the period I lived through. And actually, honestly, that was the most fun chapter to write just because it was a matter of re redoing the history in many, many ways, you know, it was, it was um, in many ways, but especially the part I found most enjoyable, David, and actually I, I you're gonna find this crazy to believe, um, at almost 80, I spent three full months doing nothing but listening to pop music from the 50s and 60s. Um, because it turns out you can see this, this shift. The shift, by the way, happens in the middle of the 60s. As some people, some people say, the 60s, most of the 60s actually happened in the 70s. But the first half of the 60s, up until 1964, in, in real America, was basically, we came into that period in the, in the early 60s, up until about 1964, roughly speaking. And, and we were on a very upward trajectory towards, towards ever more, you know, a more encompassing sense of we, and then somehow like a kind of a kind of backflip, we came out of the 60s going in exactly the opposite direction, going, becoming um, ed, ed, steadily more I. Now, of course, we didn't become, none of these changes happened overnight. So I, we never claimed that sort of in 1964, suddenly everybody, Amer every American became selfish. That's not the direction. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that the, the direction of change there, if you're mathematically, we're saying this first derivative was, was the, the second derivative was, was changing, that we began, instead of going up, we began going down, but we didn't hit bottom until about now, actually. So what was it that caused that shift in direction in the middle of 1960s? Um, we, in, in one, some ways, we kind of, we kind of um, avoid that question, but I think this is actually a true fact. There were so many different things happening to American society in the, in the middle 1960s, so many different things that were happening. And they were, some of them were related, but most of them in, in principle were quite independent. For example, if you actually ask people my age, because I've done this, what they think caused the 60s to happen or what the essence of the 60s, what the beginning of the 60s was, they, without exception, people my age refer to the assassinations, the assassination of, of, um, of uh, John Kennedy and then shortly thereafter of, uh, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. So that's the big thing that the people of my age think about. Um, 
if you talk to um, other people, of course, a little, a little older, but, but still of that boomer generation, they talk about the Vietnam War. And they said the Vietnam War caused all of this stuff. And certainly the Vietnam War was, was part of this, but there's no causal connection between the Vietnam War and, and the assassinations. I mean, there, you, you can make up some conspiracy theory about, but it, it, nobody, no serious person thinks that the, either the Vietnam War caused the assassinations or the assassinations caused the Vietnam War. And take another example, the economics, which happens admittedly a, a couple of years later, in that period, the trigger for the economic crisis was the, uh, the gas, the, 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 uh, gas, the oil embargoes and the gas lines and so on in, the, in, in America. And that was certainly a part of the story, but nobody claims that there's some causal connection between the, the, the Vietnam War or the assassinations and, and, the, and, the, um, and the oil price crises. And then there's the political polarization that is to some extent related to that, but it's, it's really on a separate, operating on a separate plane. And so what we say is a lot of the crises that happened in the 60s were themselves determined by things outside the realm. I mean, the Vietnam War was determined by things that happened, you know, in the, in the aftermath of World War II and, and Ho Chi Minh and so on, and the assassinations, who knows what caused that. It was maybe just in the mind of, of Lee Harvey Oswald and, and, you know, who knows what was in the mind of the people who, the, 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 the sheikhs who, who turned off the petroleum pipelines, but they all happened at the same time and it kind of caused a nervous breakdown in American society. That's what our real view is. And you could, you know, if you, if you happen to be, David, you're much younger than me, but if you happen to be uh, a poet- you, you and I are exactly the same age. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, great. If, you, if, you, if you're our age, the most fun chapter in the book to read is the chapter on the 60s, because it's a trip down memory lane. It's exactly what we remember. And the songs that, they, that were popular that I spent four months listening to again were the songs that were popular when we were, when we were kids. So it's, it's a lot of fun if you're, if you're of that generation. If you're, I know this very well, because I have a, a co-author who's not of that generation, and she was constantly telling me, Bob, our readership is going to be bored to tears. They know that's not their period. And so the reason I'm answering this question is I had to fight to make sure that there was at least some of the 60s in there. The answer to the, I'm trying to answer your question, David, a little, in, not indirectly, but I'm trying to answer your question. We think that there was no single explanation of, what, of why the change in the, the 60s happened. If, there, if you had to point to one thing, you'd say it was the civil rights movement, which caused a white backlash. And we spent a lot of time, as you know, David, on race, because we think race is an important part of the story. And we think actually that there's some, uh, some of the normal, normal accounts of, of the history of racial equality in America in the, in the 20th century. Some of them are actually misguided, but we for sure agree that um, there was a very strong white backlash right after the civil rights legislation of 1964 and that led into, therefore, the, the riots in Chicago at the, at the 68, um, 68 convention and so on. So I, I think if we were forced to, you know, and we had, you know, a gun at our head, forgive me the, the metaphor, but if we were forced to say, well, what caused the, the 60s reversal, we would say a lot of things, but probably a big part of it is, is back, quite backlash to the, to the civil rights movement. But there and were a lot of other things that were happening why did baby naming change? Which it did, David. Baby naming changed. People moved from common names of kids like John and, and Mary to, you know, weird names like Shailin, uh, forgive me. And, and they moved to very unusual names. At, at, you know, and, and that change occurs exactly in 1964. Well, it's hard to think of some, re some explanation that would fit that. Fit, and, and would also fit, I don't know, split ticket voting or, or um, you know, um, regulation of industry or whatever. No, again, this I'm, is yet I'm another, cognizant. Oh. Excuse me, Shailen, let me just interject and I'm going to give you the, the word too. But uh, the naming stuff really interests me a lot because again, it's just extraordinary to me how, how these data line up in, the, in so many different dimensions. But that made me think of my own family. In my family, there are six generations of oldest sons named Thomas Kennedy. And get this, it, it, this get, the story gets even stranger because every one of them, mar every, six in a row, married a woman named Mary. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mary Kennedy. 
in my kids' generation, they all, with one exception, they all named their kids for people that I'd never heard of. And the names are kind of semi made up. And the whole idea of you name your kids for somebody back in the family in the ancestral line meant absolutely nothing to them. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I was a wee communitarian, but uh, I was actually pregnant during the very end of, of drafting this manuscript, and I ended up giving my son an even stranger name than I have. <laughs> so I guess I'm a victim of this trend as well. Uh, that's funny. I just, I just wanted, I'm cognizant of time. I just wanted to underscore what Bob said about the white backlash. I mean, I think there's a real argument to be made here, and it's something that we do like to highlight, of course, that you know these wee decades that we're describing during the first two thirds of the 20th century, you know, there is a very, very strong argument to be made here that those were fundamentally building a white male we, right? And there are ways, really important ways in which um, things were getting better and better for African-Americans and other groups, other excluded groups during that period. And we have two chapters in the book where we look at that in detail, but at the same time, and of course, we argue that that the the watershed legislation of the civil rights era would not really have been possible were it not for this slowly building we ethos. Those 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 civil rights acts would not have been able to pass were it not for us expanding our sense of of we in America. However, it is very clear that you know that support in principle for widening the we is different than support in practice for widening the we. And that's very clear in the survey data that you see. People in that era were very supportive of the Civil Rights Acts as ideas. But then when they they were asked to, to make some sacrifices in order to implement those, um, there was a very clear backlash. And so I think that to a certain extent, you know, you can't, we can't say that the white backlash caused a broader, you know, turn toward I. We can't also say that a broader turn toward I caused the white backlash. But what we can say is that the I period that, that came after the civil rights legislation has been much less hospitable to excluded groups and people of color than most people think. Um, we actually took our foot off the gas, as is sort of the metaphor we use in the book, in driving toward full racial equality in the decades you know, since the Civil Rights Act, which is counterintuitive. We think you know, that, that that's not actually the case, but it turns out that who is included in this American we is the central question in my mind, right? Not only of what, you know, what happened in the we that was uninclusive and what happened when we tried to widen the inclusivity of that we and how that, you know, we saw a backlash toward I, but it's also the central question for today. You know, in this yes. book, we're calling for a, a revised, you know, upswing, a new American upswing, but it's crystal clear, both from the history and from just the facts on the ground, that any upswing that we would aim to create in America today must absolutely be fully and completely inclusive. Otherwise it will have knit into it the seeds of its own destruction as the first upswing certainly did. And so we wanna make absolutely clear that we have not yet reached any pinnacle of inclusion in America. We, we, we reached a pinnacle, but it was a summit that was not nearly high enough. And we've got a lot more work to do in order to really do the work of creating what Eric Liu has called the world's first mass multicultural democracy. Nobody's figured that out yet. And that is what is at the feet of the rising generation in America today. Uh, David, yeah. I know we want to get to questions. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just, I can't avoid just saying one quick thing. This book was finished in January of this year. Not, there, had, there was no pandemic. There was no Black Lives Matter movement. There was no e economic collapse. But in fact, what was happening in the Black Lives Matter movement, in our view, was exactly the kind of mass-based, youth-based, um, cross-racially based um, uh, expansion of support for civil rights and for bl Black equality that we, we were hoping for. And now it's, it's and, and when we finished the book, it didn't exist, but now it's happening. and and. I and also to, a movement that is that is not shy about using moral language as yeah. its basis, right? Which again, it was that feature that we saw in the progressive era. So those facets make us very hopeful. You mentioned Eric Liu, and that puts me in mind of something else. And uh, as it happens, coincidentally, just in the last few weeks or days, I've been reading a book by Paul Collier called Exodus. 
which right. is about migration patterns worldwide, not mm-hmm. least of all the United States, but also the UK and Europe. And Bob, as you no doubt know, because you blurbed the book, so you no doubt know, he cites some work of yours in there, which in his description of it, he gives the reader the impression that you felt uncomfortable with your own findings about how diversity undermines social cohesion. And that there, there's less social capital in communities that are diverse than ones that are less diverse. Um, so it, to the extent that there's anything to that argument, it makes me think, Eric Liu, as I said, at Citizen University made me think of this too. Another thing that happened in the 60s is that we changed our immigration laws. Yes. And the ni- 1970 census shows the, the smallest proportion of foreign-born people in the United States since, since the beginning, 5%. Yes. Roughly. We're now at nearly 14%. So it's not only the civil rights movement, which brought African-Americans into precincts from which they had been excluded up to that point. Right. That's a diversification of certain areas of sectors of American life. But immigration begins to take on significant proportion yes. as well. And the society becomes operationally much more diverse. Yes. So that, perversely enough, that could be some kind of explanation for the erosion of the term you helped to popularize, Bob, social capital. Yes, trust I, um, I know that there are le- many other people who want to get in, and but I really want to answer that question because some people think it's a, it, that they found the fatal flaw in our book. And I, I actually completely disagree that it's a fatal flaw. Let's go back to the original article that I wrote now about 10 years ago, in which I reported that it's, which is true, that in the short run, I was always, all the language I'm going to use now is the language that appears in the original lecture that I gave uh, in, in, in Uppsala, Sweden. Um, in the short run, the, what the data showed was that in the short run, the effect of increased diversity, for example, immigration, is to um, impede the formation of social capital. That's just jargon for saying when you've got a lot of neighbors around you who speak a different language or maybe have a different skin color or, or at any rate are different, um, that's a little unsettling. And it, frankly, the arriving there is unsettling for them. So the short run effect of social, of, of, of immigration is to reduce social capital. And that's what the data showed. And that's what happened actually in 19, after nine, in the period between 1900 and 1920, peak in American immigration. And just as I found in my data, the short run effect of that was to cause people to hunger down and to pull in and to accentuate in this other language, accentuate the me. Um, but I also said, and, and neoconservatives who liked the first part of it, uh, I'm sorry that that includes my good friend, um, the Oxford economist that I'm sorry, you m- n- named his book uh, in a, a minute ago, but um, Paul, Paul, Paul Collier, sorry. Paul Collier. Yeah, Paul's a smart guy. He knows better than this. Um, that's a canard, because at the very beginning, I said the longer run effect of, a, of immigration in a successful society is that over the long run, the processes of assimilation on both sides actually it's not just the italians learning to to um you know to eat hamburgers it's also the rest of us learning to eat pizza that mutual assimilation is the almost certain consequence over a over a couple of generations of people you know coming to terms with each other and therefore and building a new more encompassing sense of we that's what the argument in that original article that has gotten a lot of attention, but not nearly so much readership, was saying. And I think that perfectly fits the story that now, I didn't know the IWI story then, but it perfectly fits that the first effect of immigration in the, in the 1900, 19, basically 1920 period was to cause a hungering down and that led to the imposition of, these, of the very strict immigration rules in 1923 and 1924. That's what I said what is going to happen. That, I mean, I, I'm not trying to make myself a perfect seer, but I am trying to say that people who say that I've got my facts wrong have not read what I've written. Because the second part, I then said, and a successful immigration society over time, it will, it will you know, create this integrated society, a more we-like society. And that's exactly what happened. It didn't happen overnight. Of course not, because it takes time. It's like, it made clear all the time. And that's why, that's why it was exactly in 1964, at the peak of weeness, that we felt comfortable enough to open the gate, open the floodgates. And we opened the floodgates. And eventually what happened was that lots more people came in. And the, the, the short run effect of that was to increase 
you know, anti-immigrant sentiment. That's what we're living with right now. But then Putnam says, yeah, but over time, what you'll begin seeing is the mutual assimilation of these groups, the immigrants, the former immigrants and the, and the natives. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. That's why the, the Trump's immigration policy is so widely unpopular, especially among younger people, because he's trying to insist on a really outdated, extreme eye conception of our country. And Bob, younger- Bob, I'm going to have to bring us to a conclusion here because we're in our last couple of minutes. Go. We've had a lot of questions come in uh, that I've passed on some of them to you, but one more than one questioner uh, out there in our audience today uh, asked the question, what sustains your optimism about our ability to actually turn the corner again? We have, I'm going to give you each 30 seconds to answer that question. Shaylin, do you want to have the first crack? What sustains my optimism? Uh, Again, I think that having a historical record that we've successfully done this once before is a huge part of it. Um, I think that young people today don't realize this. They've only lived during the downturn. They think that this is inevitable and they don't realize that we've done this well once before. Again, we haven't done it perfectly, but we have done it. And there's that there, there are lessons we can pick up on there. And so the more I can see young people taking up that, mindset of their own ability to master the future, the more optimistic I am. And and I do think that young people have a much more innate sense of inclusion than maybe earlier generations have had. And that is also that also makes me hopeful. I, I love the part about history matters. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will be very brief, but only to say this is one area in which Shannon and I actually do somewhat disagree. And it turns on what you think is going to happen in three weeks. I think there's going to be a landslide, a democratic landslide. It's not that it's democratic is not the point, but I think there's going to be a landslide. And I think we're going to be within, you know, months of now, actually into the pivot. We're going to be already doing the things you need to do in order to move up toward a a more we society. Shailen is a little less confident, maybe a lot less confident than me about what the election outcome will be. And therefore, I think she's a little more pessimistic. That may be related to the fact that I'm sitting in one of the in, in the bluest postal code district in one of the most blue states in America. And let me just say, Shailen lives in a very different part of the world. It'd be Utah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> well, listen, uh, our thanks to uh, Bob Robert Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett, the authors of this fascinating book, uh, The Upswing, How Americans Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Uh, We encourage you to pick up a copy at your local bookstore or actually several copies. I'm giving copies to all my three children for Christmas. So if you'd like to watch more uh, virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club effort, please visit the following website, www.commonwealthclub, all one digital word, dot org. I'm David Kennedy. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. This has been great.